welcome to the Thriving Writer Show. Today on the show, I have a special guest, neuropsychologist and best-selling author of Hope Prevails, Insights from a Doctor's Personal Journey Through Depression. Please join me in welcoming Michelle Bankston. Great to have you on the show, Michelle. Good morning, Frank. It's good to be here. Great. Now, your book just won a big award. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It did. Or so we can yeah. celebrate with you? Yes, just recently, uh, Hope Prevails Insights from a Doctor's Personal Journey Through Depression run the Reader's Choice Award in the uh, nonfiction category at the Christian Literary Awards. Awesome. That's wonderful. Now, you suffered through depression yourself, and you found a holistic way to deal with that, combining faith and practice. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and why it's effective? Yeah, I sure can. You know, I, uh, I started to write Hope Prevails really as a resource for my patients. As a neuropsychologist, I have patients who come into my office for things like depression, anxiety, concussion, dementia. And I was growing frustrated because I had people contacting me from around the country and around the world saying, can you help me? And I'm just one doctor with only so many hours in the day. So I started mm -hmm. to write the book really out of a desire to have a resource that would extend beyond the four walls of my office. But um, I really sensed that God was saying, well, that's good. We need that. But we already have enough doctors who have written books. So you're going to have to share your own personal story. And at that point, my story included the fact that I was raised in a household with a mother who was depressed my entire childhood. So oh, I wow. experienced depression from the standpoint of, you know, living with someone who was depressed. But we didn't know to call it that back then. We just thought that's just how mom is, right? Mm -hmm. And her mother yeah. had been depressed and her sister had been depressed. So I had that experience. And at the point that I was going to start writing this book, I had gone through postpartum depression after our first son was born. And that was bad, but it was time limited. Fortunately, it was identified quickly and I got treatment quickly. But two weeks after I thought, okay, I'll do this. I'll write this book. I became deathly ill. Oh, wow. And, uh, had to have two surgeries. I was on bed rest for five months. I was kept alive on IV hydration and nutrition. I went from 113 pounds down to a skeletal 74 pounds. So that's 30 pounds lighter than I am today. Wow. And really, I could do nothing, Frank. I, all I could do was sleep, pray, uh, watch sermons online and listen to praise and worship music. You know, I couldn't be the doctor anymore. I wasn't much of a wife. I wasn't much of a mother because I could do nothing. And I got to the point where really I thought, if this is all my life is going to be, I, I don't want it. Like, I don't want to yeah. be anymore. And I plunged into a very severe depression, severe. But I'm the doctor, right? So <laughs> I thought I knew all the right things to do. So I did all the things that I'd recommended to my patients for 20 years to do. Therapy, medication, diet and exercise and making sure I was getting enough rest. All those things that I would normally suggest to someone who walked in my office. And they helped. Like I want your readers to hear that. They, they helped. Um, but they weren't enough. And I just could not get out of that pit. And I was praying about it one day and just said, either you have to take me home to heaven with you, God, or, you know, you're going to have to show me what the missing link is. Because first of all, this is not helping. And second of all, I'm not going to go back to my office and be that doctor and suggest things unless I know they really help. And it was like a light bulb moment because I sensed in my heart that God was just saying, Michelle, as long as you are just treating depression the way you are and ignoring the spiritual roots, it's like putting a Band-Aid on an infection and hoping it gets better. Wow. And the light bulb went off because I realized I had been addressing the physical. I had been addressing the mental. I had been addressing the emotional. But I had not been addressing the spiritual side. And that's mm -hmm. when everything changed. Not just my own health, but how I parent, how I'm a friend, how I work with patients in my office. It was like my whole world changed after that. And that's, and the book changed as well, because the emphasis really went from a clinical emphasis in my book to sharing my story and what I've learned, hoping that other people then could get out of the pit quicker than I did. Oh, so 
that's a that's a fascinating story and um i was just thinking as you talked about not being able to do anything I, that would depress me too just because you know, i'm by nature somebody who wants to achieve all the time you know and maybe that's just part of being a man you know <laughs> We're kindred spirits in that, Frank. I picked that up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so but that's interesting. You started off as a clinical book and then faith came into it. I think that's that's fantastic. And I think that's probably why your book's you know on the bestseller list right now. Well, and people, when they write reviews, that's almost always the number one thing they say is, I like this book because she's got the clinical experience, but she shares from her personal story. And so yeah. it's relatable. But the other thing that people really like is because all I could do was sleep and pray and listen to praise and worship music, I included a um, recommended song playlist at the end of every one of my chapters because music helped me so much. There were times when I could hardly pray, much less praise. But if I would put that music on, it changed how I felt, it changed how I thought. So I put that at the end of every chapter. And that's the other thing that people comment on is, wow, that's really unique. And that has really helped me. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that's probably something you won't find in any other book. I would imagine. I've never found it. Yeah. Well, I noticed you had some pretty big endorsements, like one from Dr. Gary Chapman on your book. And I was just wanting to know, and probably a lot of the people watching will want to know, how do you get an endorsement like that? Well, first of all, um, I created my dream list when I was writing the book and I knew that my publisher was going to ask for who was going to endorse it. I created a list of those people I was pretty certain would endorse it. And then I created my dream list. And really, I'm, I'm just being honest. I prayed about it. I did. I prayed about it and I said, okay, God, you're going to have to open these doors because I don't know these people. And it was truly a God thing because uh, a friend who's a pastor asked me to come and help at a conference he was having at his church. And it just so happened to be a Dr. Gary Chapman conference. And my husband and I got to take him out to lunch and um, talk with him. And I shared about the book and he said, well, I'd be happy to read it. And I was just stunned. I was like, you would? Sure. Send it to me. I said, well, I just happened to have a copy right here. (laughs) So (laughs) I had an endorsement within the next week. That's awesome. others, others I've not been so fortunate about others I have approached and they've said it's not the right time or it's not the right project so I really believe that you know we can have our heart's desire but God's going to do the best thing for us absolutely and again you, you won't know until you ask as right. well so that's that's what you can do and what any of us can do is, is well we can pray about it and we can ask yeah yeah we've got to be willing to make the ask because they don't have an opportunity to say yes if we don't ask that's true. Have some, you know, I, don't I always provide them an out when I ask too. I always say, you know, and, and grace in advance if this is not the right time or the not, not the right project. And that's what I hope that people will do for me too, because, you know, I'm busy. I'm a doctor. I write, I speak. Um, and if I, if I can help out, I want to help out, but it's not always the right time for me to take on a new project. Well, with that in mind, I sure appreciate you giving me some of your time today. That's a, oh, that's a I'm, great I'm thing. So uh, along the way, when did you know you wanted to write the story about your book or even before it changed? When did you know that, you know, I want to write about this and tell people about this? Well, I knew that I wanted to be a writer ever since I was a child. I, you know, I started journaling, you know, in the little, little girl diary with the fake lock that doesn't really work to keep anybody out, but you know, you (laughs) you think it's going to. So I started writing when I was young and I submitted several pieces that I wrote to different magazines that were geared for my age. I won in several of the categories and several times I didn't win, but it was just the joy of writing. So I knew I wanted to write for decades. Um, I'm showing my age now, but for decades. (laughs) But then interestingly enough, I went to graduate school to become a a psychologist. And I think it must be most professors, um, innate mission to tear down all their students in theory so they can build us back up but I never got the build back up part and I had a professor say you know you can't write you can't speak and so I believed it and so I stopped writing I stopped writing for over a decade and then ironically 
I went to a writer's conference. And I say ironically because I don't know what I was doing at a writer's conference if I thought I couldn't write. But so again, I think that was just a God thing. So I went to this conference and um, people started asking what I do. And things were coming out of my mouth that I didn't even know were in my heart. And it was the statistic that by 2020, depression will be our greatest epidemic worldwide. And I shared some of my story, part of um, what I put in my book about the fact that it's not over until God says it's over. And at that conference, I had agents and editors all coming up to me saying, we want to read your proposal. Hmm. And I was thinking, I don't have a proposal. Like I haven't put two words on paper, but clearly there was an interest. So I went home and thought, okay, I don't know how to write a proposal, but I'm going to, I'm going to write a proposal because clearly this is the book that I'm supposed to write. Originally, I thought that I was going to write a book for parents of special needs children because I see so many special needs children in my practice. But um, that was not what came out of my mouth when I had the opportunity to speak. <laughs> so I found where the real need was. And, and honestly, that's where my heart is too, because since depression affected my family so severely, I wanted to do what I could to try to help with other families who don't know how to handle it. That's right. That's right. Um, you just reminded me of something too. And you said you didn't know how to write a book proposal. And I always just say, I'm learning as I go, not before I go. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right. You got 141 reviews. That's a that's pretty good many reviews. Um, how do you go about getting those? Was it mainly people who read the book and just felt moved, or did you ask for some of those? Or yeah, you know, how did how did you get so many? Well, you know, when I first wrote the book and knew when it was going to release, I devised a launch team for the book release, and out of the launch team, probably about 50 people wrote reviews. Maybe not quite that many. And I, I've just published a Bible study. And so we just hit the 50 mark. So I was really excited about that. But about 50 people from my launch team, after they read the book, wrote reviews. And then after that, it's just been readers. It's been readers who have read and who have found it helpful. And, and occasionally, I'll get an email or I'll get a message on th social media. And they'll say, you know, I've just finished your book and it really helped. And I've gone back to them and said, I'm so glad to hear that. But, you know, other people need to know which book is helpful. So would you consider saying exactly what you just said there? You don't even have to create anything new. Would you consider putting that up as a review? Because it will help other people figure out which book is the right book for them. And if this one helped you, maybe it will help someone else. And most of the time, they've been willing to do that. Awesome. Yeah, it's, a, it's great to have a network to start with and just let it grow from there. But obviously, the book is good. So that definitely helps a lot when you're when you're trying to get some support for it right yeah so, uh, so what are you working on now are you doing anything new i am um i'm always doing something new <laughs> i'm a little <laughs> bit like you frank you know i've kind of i've got to keep keep going and keep my fingers in the pot um i just released about a month ago about six weeks ago now i guess i just released the companion hope prevails bible study so we're still working on marketing that and getting the word out about that and that actually came from reader requests um i had several people write to me and say oh i loved your book it was very helpful when are you going to write a bible study and i would write back and say oh no I don't write Bible studies. You know, we're going to leave that to Beth Moore and Priscilla Shire and, you know, some of the others. And um, the more requests I got, the more I thought, am I supposed to do this? And I prayed about it and said, Lord, I don't, I don't know how to write a Bible study. And I kind of sensed him stirring in my spirit. Well, I don't know how to write it, but he does. So if I'll be obedient, he'll give me the words like he did with Hope Prevails. Um, and so that's been released. And now I'm working on, I've just finished up the sample chapters and proposal for the next book, which is going to be on overcoming worry, fear, and anxiety. Because that was another thing that my readers said, now when are you going to write a book on anxiety? And I, you know, I had several ideas about what to write about next. I've got, you know, probably six, six books in my head, but it was clear that, okay, this is what my readers want. And so I had to take my cues from them. So that's what I'm working on now. Well, that's great. Not only is it a good thing to do, but it's also a good marketing strategy to know what they want because, you know, you know, you're going to help them 
And then, you know, you're going to sell the book and have more opportunities to help people with, That's right. with your message. Yeah. So. I, had, I had another book in mind that I thought that was what was really burning in my heart. But, you know, the more I realized it, it doesn't matter what I want. It mm -hmm. matters what the readers need. So I had to get over myself and just say, OK, well, we'll put that book on the shelf for now. Maybe we'll come back to it later. But um, it's time to do what they're asking for, because we write for them. I don't write for myself. Absolutely. That's for sure. If you want anybody to read it, for sure, you definitely do have to write for the people who are going to buy it and benefit from it. That's right. Yes. So any final words you'd like to leave with our viewers today? You know, I would, I would just like to say, if, if you've got this dream in your heart to write, write. You know, I know a lot of people who say they want to be a writer, but they're not being consistent in working on their craft and in connecting with other writers and practicing the skill. Um, so if you want to write, do it. Find a place to do it, whether it's a blog or it's a newsletter, or it's helping with a ministry or it's working on your own book. But do it because if that desire is in your heart, it's there for a reason. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to become a book. But, but do it and be open to perfecting your craft. And part of perfecting your craft is reading. So, you know, people will ask me all the time, do you have time to read? Oh, yeah, I read all the time in my genre as well as in others. For one thing, it, you know, it, it strengthens my vocabulary. It stirs my imagination. But to be a good writer, we also have to be willing to be a good reader. That's for sure. Uh, if nothing else, you, you get, can broaden your experience so that your writing gets better. And it's also fun, you know, to read other people's writing just to see, you know, how they do it and maybe how you can do it better. That's right. Yeah. Well, Michelle, I appreciate your time with us today. And uh, it's great to have you here. And uh, if you want to know more about Michelle, we're going to include links in the page and we'll also direct you to where you can get her books and michelle i hope you have a great afternoon thank you you too frank thanks